Again, my name is Derek Kinder, and I'm a hydrologic engineer with the Risk Management Center. And today we're going to be discussing paleo flood hydrology and paleo flood data. So we're talking about geologic and botanical evidence of past floods and limits to floods. So these are going to be key data on extremes for flood frequency analysis. So our learning objectives here are to describe paleo flood hydrology and paleo flood data key concepts and summarize primary geologic and geomorphic features used to characterize paleo floods and limits to floods. So geologists and hydrologists have a long history of examining various features in river corridors such as terraces, fans, alcoves, bars, and trees for evidence of large floods. We're going to go through a few different um, definitions, but the one on this slide says a paleo flood hydrology is the reconstruction of the magnitude and frequency of past floods using field-based indicators of floods, which are geological and botanical evidence. So here is a, another definition of paleo flood data, but from Bulletin 17C. So we're going to cover paleo stage indicators, paleo hydrology bounds, and applied field geology techniques. So let's read this other um, definition we have here. So it's physical evidence of past floods and their ages as observed from the geologic record or from botanical evidence. Um, and it typically consists of observations on individual past floods, such as those derived from slack water deposits, boulder bars, silt lines, or botanical information. It also consists, so that's positive evidence of a flood that happened before our record. But it can also consist of periods of landscape stability that can be used to place limits on flood magnitude over time. So we know we didn't have a flood this big over some period of time. That's also important. And so paleo flood data are distinguished from historical data because they're a separate line of evidence by the use of the applied field geology techniques to examine the geomorphic and stratigraphic context of extreme floods. So key concepts on paleo flood data for flood frequency are listed here. So again, we're looking for geologic deposits or geomorphic features that give evidence of the past floods, and we call those paleo stage indicators or PSIs. So they characterize the flood peak stage. They estimate the velocity and the discharge, so based on what kind of materials there, what kind of flows and velocities that we have to have to get those geologic features there, and they can constrain the flood timing. So we use the information that we have to estimate an age of the flood. <clears throat> Geologic deposits and geomorphic features can also show the absence of floods. So if we go higher than where we found floods, we might find where we know we didn't have a flood over a long period of time. And we call those non-exceedance bounds or NEBs. So that's the minimum stage that has not been inundated within a time period. And we can use that information in our flow frequency analysis. So individual paleo floods, they are often much larger than the floods in our gauge period of record. We can develop perception thresholds over long periods of times with this information as well. And we account for uncertainties in all of this. And we account for the uncertainty in both the age and the discharge. And we use those to do different sensitivity runs in our flow frequency analysis. So unlike stream flow, where we have like a really nice USGS website and other um, tools like that, there's currently no national paleo flood database for flood frequency. Lots of different agencies are doing paleo flood analysis, like USGS, the core, Bureau of Reclamation, and universities. You can look in Bulletin 17C Appendix 3 for some of those resources. Um, the core performs field investigations for dam and levee safety studies, and we collect data for paleo flood studies where it's appropriate. Important details of, of how we do this is in Engineering Technical Letter 1100-2-4. Um, developing paleo flood information for flood frequency analysis. We'll walk through some of the details of paleo flood investigation approaches, including scoping, uh, pre-field research, field investigations, post-field analysis, and documentation and communication. So we have some pictures on the right that illustrate some uh, 2D flow modeling, um, soil stratigraphy, and age estimates from uh, Oachita River at, at Blakely Mountain Dam in Arkansas, paleo flood analysis that we completed. All right, there's a lot of text on these tables. These are really good for reference, but here we're discussing the CORE's Paleo Flood Analytical Framework that's described in that engineering technical letter, and you can see that it's scalable. We have multiple levels. These are the common primary steps undertaken during a typical Paleo Flood analysis for dam or levee safety risk assessments. 
We customize each one according to our project needs and to the specific site and watershed conditions and the risk decision framework. So if we look at level one first here, we have large uncertainty. Um, the data is useful to determine the value for flood frequency, but is not sufficient to actually apply our findings into a qualitative, a quantitative risk analysis. So level one uses simple calculations like slope conveyance or 1D hydraulic models, a quick field reconnaissance site visit and correlative age dating. So we're not running tests on that to find out. We're just saying the geology is here, the geology above and below it's this, we have relative ages. So if we move on to level two, we're getting in the field and doing detailed geomorphic mapping at multiple sites, hopefully. Um, we're digging test pits and we're finding stratigraphic sections. Typically, we'll start using 2D hydraulic models and doing quantitative age estimates, such as radiocarbon or OSL analysis. We'll talk more about that later. Um, and then we're applying those results to our flood frequency analysis and working with the geologists or working with the hydrologists and the hydraulic engineers. Um, go one level higher than that in level three, we're looking at multiple sites to get a regional chronology that is consistent for um, these large paleo floods. Personnel involved in core paleo flood analysis should have appropriate expertise and background to collect and analyze the technical data at state of practice or state of research levels. And the general requirements are listed on the screen right now for geologists and geomorphologists, hydraulic and hydrologic engineering personnel. Um, the primary H and H tasks include analyzing historical stream flows. Well, we work closely with the geologists to interpret the paleo flood data and develop accurate and appropriate flow intervals and perception thresholds for input into our flood frequency analysis that we've been talking about this week. All right, so geologic deposits and geomorphic features that give us positive evidence of past floods especially those in the geologic record that may be larger than floods from our gauging time period are called paleo stage indicators or PSIs. We talked about it earlier, but we have um, a nice figure here to kind of show you all the different types. They might be slack water deposits, eroded fans, truncated profiles, buried horizons, gravel bars, and other fluvial landforms. So these characterize the flood's peak stage and are used to estimate flow velocity and discharge and constrain the flood timing or age. So this is a really good figure. There's others like it out in different um, paleo flood literature to kind of show you all the different ways that we might find positive evidence of a really big flood kind of before our historical period of record. So shown here are some examples of paleo stage indicators. Um, the two pictures on the left are examples of slack water deposits that would inform a paleo stage indicator or PSI. The top right is a tree scar that was determined to be, um, that occurred because of a flood that also can help us inform a PSI. And the bottom right demonstrates erosional features that were used to inform a PSI. So we talked about looking at positive evidence of past floods. We can also look at positive evidence of long-term landscape stability in a geologic record, which demonstrates the opposite. It demonstrates the absence of a large flood, and we call these non-exceedance bounds. So that's a minimum stage that has not been inundated over a period of time. We can see in the figure over here, positive evidence of long-term landscape stability inform our non-exceedance bound. If you see the non-exceedance bound is looking above all the indicators where we would have positive evidence of a flood. So we're looking for not those things, just landscape stability. So here's an example of a non-exceedance bound from the Missouri River downstream of uh, the Corps Garrison Dam. Note the Aeolian sand thickness under the A horizon here. It's very stable. There's not much going on up here other than grass and wind. So there's no evidence of flood in this of a positive evidence of a flood in this profile. You can see in the figure, positive evidence of long-term landscape stability to inform our non-exceedance bound. So reach selection is a critical part of our investigation process. It's, this is first done in the office and then confirmed in the field. When we're screening potential reaches in the office, they consider, consider the proximity to river channels, watershed sediment production, site geology, and valley confinement instability. So some good reach qualities are stable bedrock channels, sandy sediments, 
and having good LIDAR data. Field characterization consists of mapping and field investigation of the paleo stage indicators and the non-exceedance bounds. We're looking for Holocene features um, and more recent fluvial and flood related activity from the last several thousand years. So when we're doing these paleo flood analysis, we're only looking from about 10,000 years ago and forward. And that's, that's generally the Holocene timeframe that you'll hear people talk about. So we're looking for terraces, fans, and in the pre-field modeling, we need to consider where are we likely to find evidence of PSIs and NEBs. Fluvial terraces and inset deposits may represent historic and prehistoric floods. So then these key features are mapped like we have, like we're showing here. They include obtaining elevations at the key, lo key locations up and downstream of the study reach. Data are collected from relevant features for sediment characteristics and samples are obtained to date the flood deposits or the feature. Data are collected at numerous locations in the river corridor. So um, identifying individual paleo floods or any bees at a location, and then we repeat at multiple locations and elevations within that river corridor. So specific ages of paleo floods can be documented by the age of the materials and can be directly tied to that flood. The age of a paleo flood can be determined from the incorporation of materials of known age in a flood deposit, such as relative soil development, where we can correlate the deposits um, and use to estimate numerical ages. If we find artifacts like arrowheads, bottles, cans, scars on trees, that can be used to help age, but more commonly we're using radiocarbon dating of charcoal, bone, or any other organic materials that we recovered from those flood deposits. Um, also, we often use optically stimulated luminescence. That's the OSL samples I talked about before. Um, it's extremely useful, especially when we can't find any organic matter in our samples. So we can't do radiocarbon dating. Um, the OSL estimates the time the sediment grains were removed from solar radiation. So it's like the last time they saw sunlight and that can document the age that they were buried. So the, the time, general time frame when that flood deposited them and covered them up. A non-exceedance bound utilize these same methodologies, but rely heavily on soil stratigraphy. All right, so here's a visual, visual example taken from two sites on the Boise River in Idaho. So let's look at the profile on the left first with a weakly developed, almost non-existent soil. And the nature of the sediment suggests relatively recent flooding, right? The radiocarbon uh, test results here show less than 200 years, and that supports that interpretation. Conversely, the profile on the right exhibits properties that are representative of a much better developed soil and a relatively long period of stability. So the radiocarbon ages from this profile were closer to 4,000 years old. So here's an example compilation of detailed mapping of terrace surfaces and sites considered and selected for investigation. So this includes stratigraphy indi indi indicative of historical flooding at one terrace. That's the orange lines here. And a lower historic unit representative of larger historic floods, that's shown in yellow. And a non-exceedance bound at a higher and older terrace about 1800 years ago, shown in red. So let's just walk through that one more time here. So we're talking that we have a historical flood in the orange locations. So that's gonna be a lower elevation closer down to the river level. And then we have a larger historical um, event shown by the yellow, and then we have landscape stability even higher in the red about 1800 years ago. And you see that they're, they're looking for evidence of these terraces and these events on both sides of the stream, on both upstream and downstream of the reach. And we can correlate all those and give us a lot more confidence than if we just went to one site here for that, you know, for maybe the yellow historic flood and one site here for another historic flood. Yep, and there's a, a picture of one of the samples that were taken in the historical flooding. So after we go into the field and collect all this data, we put it all together by compiling and analyzing that data. We have positive, if we have positive evidence of floods or PSIs for the flood of record, we can use the cross-sectional figure to look at the terraces as we step up to get a sense of the different elevations and ages. So after collection, processing, and estimation of ages, they need to be interpreted and synthesized. So this requires internal consistency of dates and all the different stratigraphic positions. 
we can, that's shown here. And also we can use the longitudinal profiles of terrace remnants along with results from our hydraulic modeling to capture the uncertainty by looking at various features that we've mapped. Putting these data sets together, we can interpret the discharges that represent the PSIs and the NEBs. To interpret the timing of the past rare floods or the interval over which no higher stages have occurred, the NEBs, we use the age estimates. In general, higher terraces are gonna be older and could be several thousands of year old, years old, while low terraces may be hundreds of years old or even just represent our historical floods that we know about just prior to our gauging period of record. All right, so there's three primary sources of knowledge uncertainty in estimating our PSI and NEB stages and discharges. They're down, those are down valley variability of terrace surface profiles, They're kind of shown here. Um, the depth and velocity of water required for sediment deposition for those PSIs, and the depth and velocity of water required for erosion of surface soil for the non exceedance bounds. So if we have positive evidence of the flood, we, we have to estimate and we will have uncertainty on how much depth of water and how much velocity, and therefore how much flow it took to get that deposition there. If we have a non-exceedance bound, we have to estimate what flood would it have taken, what kind of velocities, what kind of depths would it have taken to erode that away to help set that bound. And of course, we're going to have uncertainty on that estimate too. Um, hydraulic models such as HEC RAS 2D are often used to estimate discharges and carry those through uncertainties to estimate the flow ranges for individual floods and inform perception thresholds. So here we have an example paleo flood summary to be used in a subsequent flood frequency analysis. You can see we have longitudinal profiles here with all the different test pit locations and map terraces ranging from the younger historic flood terraces shown in yellow at the lower elevations to the older terraces as you move up in elevation with the orange terrace representing the NEB. The information in the table here, which, in, which includes the low, high, and best estimate for the age and discharge of the PSI and NEBs, those are used to estimate the flow intervals for the historic floods and perception thresholds for the historic period and the non-exceedance bounds. So we have a range in age, we have a range in flows for each of our three paleo, for each of our PSIs or non-exceedance bounds. So this chronology plot here in best fit, that represents how these paleo flood results are input into our flow frequency analysis. We can see that we have approximately 100 years of systematic data here. You know, for a normal project, we might only have 100 years. So that 100 years is our whole X axis when we put in best fit. When we have a lot of paleo flood data that gets squished down to a really small part of our X axis. So we have 100 years of systematic data. Looks like we have a historic flood that informs a small, that has a, a flow interval and a small perception threshold. But in addition, we also have this paleo stage indicator here. It occurred about 900 years ago with an estimated flow of about 100 to 190,000 CFS. So this informs the flow interval and this perception threshold here. That goes from, the, from the, our best estimate of the paleo stage indicator all the way up into our historic period. We also have a non-exceedance bound here. So again, this is positive evidence of no flood occurring at a discharge of approximately 230,000 CFS over a period of approximately 5,000 years. So that informs this perception threshold that goes back to about 5,000 years ago before the PSI. It is clear to see in this figure how adding paleo flood information increases the length of the flow record, which allows greater confidence and typically reduced uncertainty in our flood frequency relationship. All right, so in summary, we talked about paleo stage indicators or PSIs. That's geologic or geomorphic evidence of past floods. Those characterize the peak flood stage, velocity, discharge, and timing or age. And then we can also look at positive evidence of landscape stability or no floods that we call non-exceedance bounds or NEBs. Those demonstrate the absence of inundation within a given time period. And we talked about our paleo flood investigation approach, where we look at river reach assessment and characterization. We do field investigations to find the PSIs and NEBs. We're looking at soil stratigraphy, interpretation and collection of soil samples, and age estimation. And then we have to integrate with our geologists, hydrologists, and hydraulic engineers to develop inputs to the flood frequency analysis that we just showed. 
including where do we have floods, how big were they, how old were they, and quantifying what our uncertainties are about all of those pieces. So we just, in our learning objective recap from the beginning, we described paleo flood hydrology and paleo flood key data and concepts, and we summarized the primary geologic and geomorphic features used to characterize the paleo floods and the limits on those floods.